Since the primary action detailed is befits the sociological focus is that of an underclass, then the definition of the city that focus that follows will focus on the ravages of economic blight. The world Simon portrays unfolds from the question of how commerce will occur when the conventional forms of economic development cease to exist. In addressing this question, we can see the drug trade as a form of business activity that emerges when conditions for a particular group. I'm trying to do the here, so be honest. No, 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 you can't serve your customers straight up after taking their money. Somebody snapping pictures, they got the whole damn thing. See what I'm saying? If you get paid, you send their ass off. So I think that D'Angelo is the manager of the consultant. And what he's doing is trying to rationalize the drug trade within the contours of, uh, of his situation, which is a means of not getting arrested and not counting the trade. I mean, I don't know how you have you shit up in the towers, but down here if you want to count. Oh, shit. Hey, yo, yo, ho, ho, ho! Y'all niggas been burnt. Huh? Huh? That's what you thing. got to say? So, can I ex. Yes. Oh, shit. Okay, that's what I want. Okay. Uh, the season largely takes place in two institutional situations in the law enforcement sector of city government and in the spaces of public housing where drugs are sold. These locales define the emphases of the narrative arc and other places occur because of their relative relationships, both geographic and in terms of the key characters to those locations. The complex narrative lines and ways in which the wire does not quite conform to our genre expectations are key aspects of its appeal. These elements are defined and enhanced by the series' visual style. Indeed, the Baltimore we come to understand is largely a matter of the map defined by the composition of the individual shots and scenes and the ways in which the series moves from scene to scene. In that depiction, then, Baltimore is a city that coheres in its discrete regions, but which is segmented into these specific areas according to the function of its inhabitants in the larger drama of race and crime. In a voiceover to season one, David Simon invokes the words of the late executive producer supporting the actor in the series, Bob Colesbury, to stay wide. Simon defines this as a compositional motif, a desire not simply to film the action that articulates the constrained plot of the episode, but to show more broadly the world in which it takes place, the larger story, as the Russian formalist would distinguish, of which it is a part. The meaning of this assertion becomes fairly clear as we look at the visual language of the season. The Wire is a character-driven drama, and as a result, it spends much time dwelling on close-ups and mid-close-ups of the central characters and their interactions with one another. As an ensemble piece, it is deeply invested in elaborated relationships, so it has many tightly framed two shots that feature characters conversing, whether it's the police partners, Bunk and McNulty, uh, Greggs and Daniels, more police characters, or the drug lords, Barksdale and Bell. Often as these conversations wind down, the camera will pull away to reveal a slightly wider, wider, but only somewhat wider context. This shift in perspective defines the Colesbury desire to shoot wide, but it is only the relative strategy. So here we have, this is the opening scene before the credits, and it is kind of an establishing shot for the whole first season, and it features uh, Jimmy Melty talking about the motivation behind the murder that sits before him. That's... You know, he forgets his jacket. So his nose starts running, and some asshole, instead of giving me two, thanks, he calls him snot. Snot, so he's snot fair. Doesn't seem fair. Life just beat him, Lee, I guess. So, who shot snot? I ain't going to no court. And again, just look at the tightness of the shot and the way that we gradually, eventually, pan out. Motherfucker ain't had to put no cap in him, Definitely not. He could have just whipped his ass like we always whip his ass. I agree with you. Kill Snap. 
It's not been doing the same shit since I don't know how long. Kill a man over some bullshit. <clears throat> I'm saying. And every Friday night, we're in the alley behind the cut ring, we roll the balls, you know? I mean, all the boys from around the way, we go to late. I mean, crap game, right? Like every time, he snot. It fade a few shooters. Play it out to the pots deep. Snatch and run. Well, every time? Couldn't help us, son. <laughs> Let me understand you. Every Friday night, you and your boys will shoot crap, right? But every Friday night, your pal snot with you. He'd wait till there was cash on the ground, then you'd grab the money and run away. You let him do that? Man, we'd catch him and beat his ass, but ain't nobody never go past that. Every time you snap group, we grab the money and run away. Why don't you even let him in the game? What? With snap we always stole the money. Why'd you let him play? God, it's America, man. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, the wider shop, and that's the complex is the murder on the street. Of course, there are credits. But again, you know, it's, it's the uh, visual style that I want to emphasize. It's the way, the tightness of the shot and the way that, they, that we shoot wide and what we, when we shoot wide, we actually find the motivation for the shot and we get a little more Baltimore, which is, you know, the, the kind of uh, filling in the canvas by the, the accretion of more and more uh, shots such as that that defines the visual style of the series. Uh, this vision of the Liberty's definition, this vision of a limited definition of a particular context shows itself in the very next scene when D'Angelo Barksdale is being tried for murder. And again, much the same visual strategy. And this is our courtroom scene where D'Angelo, who is the nephew of Avon Barksdale, is being tried for murder. Do you promise to tell the truth, this the whole the truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And what you should take away from this. Ma'am, can you state your name, please? So that's, uh, Stringer Bell, from the Drug Lords. And are you employed? And yes, I am. And what is your occupation, Ms. Lance? That's I'm the a security guard. Motif of, uh, and uh, were you employed as a security guard on but May 4th? But it's the closeness, it's the proximity. Uh -huh. And what were your duties on that? The day? figures in the court. I was in the booth of 221. Mm -hmm. And is that the guard booth in the lobby the of the Fremont Avenue high rise? Drama. Uh, yes. And you're behind bulletproof glass with a, a clear view of the lobby. Uh, yeah. Good. Now, Ms. Valens, I know this may be difficult for you, but can you tell us what you saw? Um, a man, you know, he was waiting for the elevator, and when another man just starts beating on him, and like the one man, he got knocked down, and the, the victim got knocked down? No, the so man with the gun. Are, you know, we're getting the man was knocked wider, down we're more and more. And, and do you see that man in the courtroom today? And really, the motivation nope. of the scene is the, the proximity of Bill to the witness, Excuse me? who is being intimidated and therefore changing your story. He ain't here. You don't. You testify. Ms. Lyles, do you remember when Detective Barlow showed you this photo array? Yeah. Good. I call your attention to your initials, which identified this photo. So that's, you know, the terminus of their case, which, you know, suggests the futility of the, the devices of law enforcement and the way it becomes, it's, it retains itself as an ongoing game. But again, you know, the visual style where you, you know, you're uh, just gradually extending context and that becomes an important device, you know, over the course of many episodes.